All right, so welcome everybody to the Robert Ferguson Observatory Speaker Series. Um, my name is Stephanie Duromilar and I'm the volunteer coordinator for the observatory. Uh, we're thrilled and honored to have Mr. Rick Letman presenting for us today. And I'm gonna introduce him in a moment. But before we start, just wanna remind everybody to please keep yourself muted to minimize background noise. And um, we'll open up for questions at the end. You're also welcome to post questions in the chat, which I'll monitor and we'll ask uh, Mr. Lutman to answer once he's done with his presentation. So just briefly, for those of you who are not familiar with the Robert Ferguson Observatory, um, it is run by the Valley of the Moon Observatory Association, which is a 5013C nonprofit comprised of volunteer amateur and professional astronomers. RFO has fulfilled its mission of offering educational programs about science and astronomy for students, the public, and in support of educators for almost uh, or about 25 years now. Uh, the observatory is almost all volunteer run and uh, typically under normal circumstances uh, serves about 9,000 visitors annually. It's located in Sugarloaf State Park and houses a 40 inch reflector telescope, the largest telescope in Northern California that's accessible to the public, a robotic 20 inch research grade or CCD telescope and an eight inch two meter long refractor telescope. Um, also wanted to mention that we've, oops, sorry, letting more people in. Oh no, I'm good, okay. Um, also wanted to mention that we've kept the presentations in our speaker series free to the public to align with our mission of offering educational-based astronomy programs to our community. Um, that being said, if anyone is so inspired to donate to the Robert Ferguson Observatory to ensure that we can continue fulfilling that mission, uh, you can do that through our website at rfo.org. So to, uh, to introduce our speaker today, Rick Lutman is now Professor Emeritus of Mathematics at Sonoma State University, where he has been on the faculty since 1970. He has degrees in mathematics from Amherst College, Stanford University, and the University of Arizona. He represents retired faculty on the Academic Senate and previously served on the Senate for 15 years, including a term as faculty chair. He has eclectic academic interests. He has taught general education courses on symmetry in art and science, mathematics of growth and form, math and politics, and ethno-mathematics. He helped create the public lecture series on war and peace issues and directed it for 25 years. He has written two books on symmetry and two on raising backyard fowl, <laughs> um, as well as papers on Eskimo dancing based on his field research in Alaska that we were just talking about. Uh, he's a certified financial planner and had a mini career in financial planning. He has had an abiding interest in astronomy since he was seven years old and was allowed by his general science instructor in seventh grade to teach the unit on astronomy. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to you, Rick. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, and good evening, everyone. Um, it's unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, we can't be at the observatory in person tonight, but uh, I guess this will have to do. I did give this lecture at the observatory about uh, three or four years ago for the math club, which had a, an event up there. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, at, uh, as a faculty member at Sonoma State, um, which is a liberal arts institution, I am allowed to begin a math lecture by citing some poetry. And uh, you see some uh, examples on the screen here, but let's look at these. <clears throat> in the upper right corner in red is uh, a fragment from Hamlet where Shakespeare uh, uh, uses these remarkable words, this most excellent canopy, this brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, oh my. And I would have just said sky. <laughs> and the lower right in blue are some fragments from a poem by Maya Angelou uh, called A Brave and Startling Truth. She's talking about how insignificant the earth is in the universe. And she's, here's how she, she describes our planet. A small and lonely planet traveling through casual space past aloof stars across the way of indifferent suns. This minuscule and kithless globe, this mote of matter, this small and drifting planet, 
this wayward floating body. I think she's, she's captured the essence of it uh, very poetically here. And on the uh, lower left in green is a short poem in its entirety by Emily Dickinson. The brain is wider than the sky. For put them side by side, the one the other will include with ease and you beside. Now, Emily Dickinson is famous for enigmatic poems and I'm not going to say I have any better idea than anybody else does what she meant by this. But uh, the way I think of it is here we are, a rather insignificant species. Um, uh, best thing we got going, going for us is our brains, but they're only at, you know the size of a cantaloupe or something. And yet, using our brains, we have come to a, an incredibly um, extensive understanding of the universe, both at, the, at very small scales, like viruses, and very large scales, such as galaxies. Now, of course, we don't know everything. We're still puzzling over what dark matter is and what happened before the Big Bang. But um, I think this lecture itself will show us that, in effect, our brain has spanned the sky. Well, we're going we're gonna to measure it, and we're going to find that it's enormous. Um, now, we um, are binocular creatures, as, as many uh, other creatures are. Uh, some animals have the, the eyes on the side because they're, they're prey and they have to have a, a wide range of, of view to see the predators coming. But we're in the class that needs uh, depth perception more like um, animals that live in trees or birds of prey and so on. Um, and it's the fact that our eyes get two different perspectives on the world that gives us the mathematical information. We don't have to think about this, it happens automatically, to tell depth. But since our eyes are only about three or four inches apart, um, the difference in perspective is not, not good past, oh, say 100 feet, we, do, we can't tell distance. So when we look up to the sky, we see all sorts of interesting things, but we have no idea how far away they are. We could see a cloud, we could see the moon, we could see a star. We can see that when the moon and the cloud uh, collide, the cloud comes in front of the moon and when the moon and the star collide, the moon comes in front of the star. So we know their order, cloud, moon, star, but we have no idea that the, the cloud may be just a couple of miles away and the moon's a quarter of a million miles away and the stars might be untold trillions of miles away. <clears throat> Uh, so we're going we're gonna to look tonight at how we stand here on our planet and we figure out what the distances are to uh, the various things we see in the sky. There's only one place that we can actually make a direct measurement of distance, and that's here on the Earth. Uh, we've been to the moon when uh, our astronauts went there half a century ago, and Neil Armstrong bounded down the steps and made one small step for a man. It's not as though he was trailing a quarter of a million mile long tape measure behind him. Can you picture him holding it up against a rock and saying, okay, Houston, pull it tight at your end and give me a reading. That's not how it works. Um, we make our measurements here and everything else is done uh, indirectly. And the remarkable thing is mostly by measuring angles and also measuring time. There'll be a few exceptions to this. Uh, uh, as we get deeper into the talk, there'll be some cases where we have to measure, dis uh, measure um, brightness of stars and, and perhaps do some spectral analysis, but mostly it's angles. And that's why I called this lecture the apotheosis of trig. Uh, literally an apotheosis is a becoming uh, God, but more broadly it means uh, rising to grandeur and uh, it's a humble subject after all, most people study it in, in high school, uh, but it's, it's what does the trick here. So our first job is to figure out how big the earth itself is. We're gonna need that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there's several ways that, that we can measure the earth, but I like this particular one that I'm gonna show you. Uh, it was done by a, a uh, man named Al Biruni was an ethnic Iranian. He was born in what is now Uzbekistan. 
Um, as a young man, he heard about some intellectual uh, progress being made in India in mathematics. Uh, they were developing what we now know as trigonometry. So he went there to see what was happening. And on his way back, he passed through Afghanistan and uh, uh, across this very broad plain, it's very flat, but it had one mountain in the middle of it. And he thought to himself, you know, if I went to the top of that mountain and simply measured the angle of depression of the horizon, uh, I could figure out how big the earth is, but I have to know how high the mountain is over the plain. So he figured out a way to do that. And it turns out it was a little under 1100 feet above the plain. Um, <clears throat> so here's a little sketch of, of um, what was going on there. Uh, I know this is a rather peculiar looking mountain. I just sketched something uh, to uh, mark it. And I've, I've marked this point here at the apex of the mountain. I've called it T for top. I've dropped a uh, vertical line down here to the level of the plain. And this point here is B for, for bottom. So from T to B, top to bottom, that's what we want to find out. What, and I've called that H. H is the height of the mountain. Of course, that can't be measured directly because the mountain itself is in the way. So what Al Biruni did was he went out here on the plane to a point we'll call P and using some sort of angle measuring device like a sextant, he measured the angle of elevation of the top of the mountain, which is his angle phi here between his line of sight to the top and horizontal. Then he marched a, a distance further from the mountain straight out and I see I've got a miss, I've got a typo here. That shouldn't be T because T denotes this point. That should be D. He went a distance D further out to this point Q. And from there, he also measured the angle of elevation, which is uh, called omega here. And it's, a, it's smaller, of course, because the further away you get from something, the smaller it looks. Now, the triangle TBP is a right triangle, the angle, uh, the right angle down here at B. So we can do some trigonometry here. The cotangent of phi is the side adjacent to it divided by the side opposite it. That's um, PB divided by H. And I wrote that down here. And we can do the same thing for the, uh, the other triangle because TBQ is also a right triangle with its right angle at B. So the cotangent of omega, which I've written here, is QB over H. Now we don't know either QB or PB, but we do know their difference. That's the, the measured distance D. So I'm going to take the difference of these two equations. I'm gonna subtract this one from this one. On the left, we'll get the cotangent of omega minus the cotangent of phi, and that's equal to QB over H minus PB over H. There it is. We can uh, rewrite that this way with a single denominator of H and use the fact that QB minus PB is D. Well, now we have a simple equation here. We can solve it for H and we get that H is equal to D divided by this difference of the cotangents. That's how he figured out how high that mountain is. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Let's see, there's another slide here I'm uh, looking for. This one, yeah. So, so he went up to the top of the mountain and as planned, he measured the angle of depression of the um, line of sight to the horizon. So we've stepped back a bit here. We can see the, um, uh, a quarter of the, of the Earth's circumference. And uh, <clears throat> this is a cross section through the Earth. Um, by a plane that contains this radius from the center of the earth out to Al Biruni there at, at the top of the mountain. Um, this line here is horizontal, perpendicular to the vertical. And, and uh, this is his line of sight to the horizon. Uh, this, this line just grazes the earth and therefore it's a tangent to the earth. It, um, I, I'm calling this point S. And at S, there's a right angle then between the line of sight and the radius. 
Um, I'm calling this angle beta, and I want to persuade you that that's the same as this angle down here. The reason is that, um, first of all, the, the angle from the center to T to S is a part of this right angle here between the horizontal and the vertical. So this angle over here, S, T, center of Earth, is the complement of beta. But the triangle from T to S to the center of the Earth is also a right triangle because of this right angle here. And uh, the angles of a triangle add up to 180, and this, this one's using up 90 of that already, so the other two add up to 90. That means that this angle up here, S, T, center of Earth, and this one down here are also complements. Well, because this angle and this angle are both complements of the same angle, they must be equal. That's why we know this is beta. Now we can do some trig. I want the secant of beta, and I've written it down here. The secant of beta is defined as the hypotenuse of the triangle, that's R plus H over here, divided by the side adjacent, which is R. That's right here. Divided out, we get one plus H over R. What we wanna do is find R, so we're gonna solve this equation for R. We subtract one from both sides, so H over R is secant beta minus one. Turn everything upside down, R over H is one divided by secant beta minus one. And by multiplying by H, we get this bolded uh, equation here, R is equal to H over secant beta minus one. We can combine that with the statement on the previous slide and get that H is D over, uh, well, no, and we had that H is D over this difference, the cotangents, therefore R, is d over the difference of the two cotangents times one less than the secant of beta. So there's the formula that involves one measure of distance and three angles. And that's how he calculated that the uh, radius of the earth is approximately uh, in units, we would understand 3,960 miles. He probably used some other measure uh, for distance. I do want to call your attention to one thing I'll need on the next slide. I didn't label this line here, but from T to S is the distance from Al Biruni on the top of the mountain to the horizon. And uh, if we call that Z for horizon, <laughs> uh, that and R and R plus H are the sides and hypotenuse of a right triangle. And we'll use the Pythagorean theorem in a minute. Um, <clears throat> So a few things uh, to note here. Uh, I've been treating the earth as a sphere. That's a, that's a model. I mean, we're used to that in mathematics. We shave off some of the rough edges of reality and, and take, a more, take shapes that are more perfect than they actually are in reality. Um, the earth is not a perfect sphere. And I'm not just talking about mountains and valleys, although they seem quite prominent to us being only five to six feet tall. Um, the skin of an orange is actually much uh, less smooth than the Earth's uh, surface. But here's another thing about the Earth. It's spinning and it's somewhat plastic because the inside of it is, is molten. So it bulges out a bit. In fact, it, it, it's 13 miles thicker through the, the equator than it is from pole to pole. Besides that, there's more land in the Northern Hemisphere than in the Southern. If you, if we're used to looking at globes with the North Pole at the top. It's interesting to take a globe and look at it upside down because you'll see a lot more water in the southern hemisphere than you're used to seeing in the northern. Um, okay, um, about the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, the Pythagorean theorem would say z squared plus r squared is r plus h squared. And since we now know r, this can be thought of as a formula that links z, the distance to the horizon, to h, the height above uh, sea level, basically. Uh, we can solve this equation for z. Um, and neglecting one very small second order term, we get an equation that looks like this. z, the distance to the horizon, is square root of 3 halves times the height that you are above the water. Now. 
<clears throat> most of the time when we calculate something like this, we are fussy about making sure we use the same units for the input as the output. However, in this case, it's much easier to put in feet uh, as your height and get out the answer in miles. So I took that into account. And uh, the formula here works out very nicely because of the sheer coincidence, and that's all it is, that the radius of the earth in miles, 3,960, is exactly three quarters of the number of feet in a mile, 5,280. So that's why this comes out so nicely. Um, let me illustrate uh, the use of this formula in a few special cases. Suppose you're at the seashore and your eye is six feet above sea level. Well, that's H is six. You take half of it, which is three, and augment the six by it. That's nine. Square root of nine is three. So your horizon at that point is three miles away. Uh, if you go to, up to the crow's nest of a ship, and that crow's nest is 96 feet above the sea, you augment this 96 by half of it, which is 48. You get 144. The square root of that is 12. So you are seeing a hor uh, horizon. 12 miles away. And by the way, if there was another ship um, symmetric to that, 12 miles beyond that point, and there was a crow's nest in, in that ship, uh, 96 feet, the two lookouts would be able to just barely see each other across the, uh, the, the line of sight that grazes the sea. If you're 600 feet up on the Marin headlands, the horizon is 30 miles away. If you're up uh, near the summit of Mount Tamalpais at 2,400 feet, it's 60 miles away. If you're on the top of a, a 15,000 foot mountain, you know, there aren't any of those in the lower 48 or Hawaii, but there are lots of them in Alaska and Northwest Canada and Mexico and the Incas, the, um, the, um, <clears throat> uh, the mountains in South America. Uh, you could, you, from a 15,000 foot mountain, you could see the horizon 150 miles away. And by the way, it works in the other direction too. If you were standing at sea level, you could just barely see the top of a mountain um, uh, based on its height versus how far it is away. For example, Denali Peak in Alaska, which formerly was known as Mount McKinley, is about this high. And um, that means if you were standing at sea level, you could just see the, the summit of the mountain from 175 miles away. And that's, of course, assuming it the weather is clear and there's nothing blocking your, your view. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's look at uh, one other thing quickly. This, I mentioned that Al Biruni was not the only one to measure the size of the earth. As far as we know, the first person to do that was Eratosthenes who lived in Alexandria in Egypt in the third century BC. I'll just quickly go through this. He was, as far as we know, the first person to measure the earth. Uh, there's a little town that doesn't exist anymore. It was called Cyan. It's near Aswan. Um, and it's on the Tropic of Cancer, which means that on midsummer day at noon, the sun is straight overhead. And they, they knew that because they could look into a deep well and see the sun reflected in the water at the bottom of the well. At the very same time at Alexandria, a known distance to the north, a vertical post would cast a little bit of a shadow. Eratosthenes measured this angle here. He made the reasonable presumption that the sun's rays are essentially parallel. So therefore, this angle down here is also seven and a half degrees by the theorem about alternate interior angles and parallel lines. Seven and a half degrees happens to be one forty-eighth of a full circle. That means this arc between A and W, between Alexandria and the well, is 1 of the circumference. So you merely multiply this known distance by 48 and you have the circumference of the Earth. Eratosthenes was measuring in uh, measuring distances in unit he called stadia, which we assume was defined by their, their stadia. Uh, they did vary in size, but he was probably referring to the <clears throat> the Grand Stadium in Olympia, where the um, ancient Olympic Games were held. And that's about a tenth of a mile. So uh, 
this uh, 5,200 stadia between Alexandria and Cyane multiplied by 48 and divided by 10, so we have, have it in miles, gives us about 25,000 miles, which is very close to uh, the accepted value today. Um, <clears throat> I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the devil's advocate here. And let's move on to um, the sky because that's what we're really here to talk about tonight. And that, if, that means the first thing we should talk about is the sun and the moon. We'd like to know four things, how far away are each of them and how big are each of them. And as a first step in settling that, we can make use of a very uh, bizarre coincidence. And I'm sure you're probably all aware of this, even if you've never expressed it this way. The moon and the sun coincidentally appear about the same size in our sky. Turns out the sun is much bigger and much further away, but there's an exact compensation there. And they, so they both appear about um, half a degree in radius, 0.51 uh, degrees. Now, uh, you might say, well, they couldn't, they surely aren't exactly the same size. One of them must be slightly bigger. Well, it turns out there are secondary effects here. They, they, they both change in size, in apparent size. I and mean, obviously they're not changing, but, but their apparent size changes because their distance from it changes. So the moon is going around the earth, not in a circular orbit, but in an elliptical orbit, orbit with the sun at one focus. And that means it's sometimes a little further away and sometimes a little closer. When it's further away, it looks smaller. When it's closer, it looks bigger. Similarly, the earth is going around the sun in an elliptical orbit with the sun at one focus. And therefore the sun is alternately a little further away and smaller or a little bigger and a little closer and larger. <clears throat> now we can see this uh, effect very clearly when there's an eclipse of the sun. If it happens at a time when the moon is relatively smaller and the sun is relatively bigger, the moon's disk is not big enough to cover the sun's disk fully. And at best, there will be a black disk superimposed over the sun, but there'll be a ring of fire visible around it. And from the Latin word uh, for ring, we call that an annular eclipse. Um, <clears throat> the last e eclipse we had was in June, and um, it was an annular eclipse. Uh, here is here is a photo um, that was taken in Toronto, or actually probably some distance from Toronto, because this was looks like it was taken with a uh, telescope or telescopic lens. But this shows uh, the moon just moving away from the sun. This was an eclipse that not a lot of people could see because it was mostly visible in the uh, relatively uninhabited Arctic regions. The path of totality went from Northeastern Canada across Greenland and eventually down into Siberia a, a bit. Um, <clears throat> so on the, and, and by the way, the eclipse has happened about every six months and the third e eclipse before this one, which was in December of 2019, was also an annual e eclipse. At the opposite extreme, the sun is smaller and the moon is bigger and the moon's disk will cover the whole sun. And as it moves by, it takes maybe eight to nine minutes uh, to pass completely in front of the sun. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, this sketch that I've got here is of course greatly uh, out of scale, <laughs> but I did it so you could see it and get the, get the idea. Um, the main thing we learn here is that distances and size are proportional. On this sketch, it looks like the sun is maybe five times uh, the distance uh, from you that the moon is, and so it would be five times bigger. So we don't know what any of the four numbers are, but we at least know this relationship between them. All right. Um, now, <clears throat> here's another step in getting some information about the relative distances and sizes. Uh, I'm using here an, uh, an idea that comes from 280 BC. A very clever Greek named Aristarchus thought of this method of determining exactly how far, how much farther, let's say, the sun is than the moon and how much bigger. 
uh, as the moon goes around the earth relative to the sun, uh, we first, at, at the new moon, we see only the, the, the dark side, although of course it's, <laughs> it's full earth <laughs> for the people on the moon there and, and the earth is quite bright. So um, we actually can see earth glow on the moon at that point, but we see a little bit of the uh, lighted side and then a little more of it, a little crescent shaped and so on. And eventually it's half full and then it goes on through the gibbous phase to full and so on. Let's take a look at what happens at the very moment when the moon is exactly half full. That would mean that the um, that we're looking at the moon from directly perpendicular to the sun's rays. So here's a here's a sunbeam coming in from the sun to the moon, and our line of sight must be at right angles to it. So at that point, the Earth, Moon, and Sun make a right triangle with the right angle at the moon. We're down here, we can measure this angle. And so our, uh, Aristarchus did that and he got 87 degrees. And then he said, well, the secant of 87 degrees is about 20 and that's the ratio of this piece, which is the distance to the sun to this piece, which is the distance to the moon. So he inferred that the sun was 20 times farther away than the moon and therefore 20 times bigger. Well, his theory was great, but his instrumentation was crude. And it turns out that this angle is actually not 87 degrees. It's much closer to 90. <clears throat> By modern methods, we've determined that it's 89 degrees, 51 minutes. This angle over here then, instead of being three degrees, as he thought, was more like nine minutes. Three degrees is 180 minutes. So he was off by a factor of 20 here. And that means the moon was, and that the sun is actually about 390 times farther away than the moon and 390 times larger. Now to get any further here, we're going to need to uh, think about eclipses of the moon. Um, <clears throat> the sun's bigger than the earth. So the shadow that's cast by the earth is, is, is gonna be a cone, a long cylinder cone. I have to remind you, uh, even though it's obvious, uh, you're looking at a screen which is two dimensional, but of course the universe is really three dimensional. So the earth appears as a circle here, but it's really a sphere. And these two dark lines look like a wedge, but they're really a, a, a cone. It'd be interesting to find out where this point here is, the tip of the cone. If um, if we were standing there, we would find that this is exactly the place where the earth will block out the sun. And while you're inside this, you can't see the sun at all. This is a full shadow. It's called the umbra from the Latin word for shadow. If you move to, right to the edge, you'll just start to see the sun peek out from the, the, behind the earth. And as you move out this way, you'll see more and more of the sun. So you're in a partial shadow here, and that's called a penumbra, from the Latin word for almost, like peninsula is almost an island, and penultimate is almost the last. Now we can figure out where this point is because the radian measure of this angle, and we do know the angle, is equal to the arc length across here, which is essentially the diameter of the Earth, divided by this distance. Of those three things, we know. Um, two of them, so we can solve for this distance. This is why we had to find the size of the earth, by the way, this is, a, this is where we need that. And it turns out this tip here is this far out there, almost 900,000 miles. <clears throat> well, where's the moon? Moon's coming around us in a circular arc and, in, and uh, on occasions it passes through this shadow. And I've illustrated here a possible orbit for the moon but remember that the moon also appears to be half a degree in angular measure. And that means the moon has to fit into this cone here between the two dot, dotted uh, blue lines. If it's closer to us, it's got to be smaller. If it's farther out, it can be bigger. In fact, if it were this far out, it'd be just as big as the Earth. So <clears throat> as the moon passes through the Earth's shadow, <clears throat> I've shown it here just as the leading edge begins to enter the shadow and then a, 
little bit later when it's trailing edge enters the shadow. Now it's fully in the shadow. There it is going across. Then at a certain point, the leading edge begins to exit the shadow. And then finally the trailing edge comes out of the shadow. Now that's one possibility, but what if the moon is closer to the earth? Like say it's in here. Well, then it's much smaller because it's got to fit into this wedge, but the shadow is much wider. So the tinier moon will come in, the leading edge will, oh, uh, down here, the leading edge will come in and very quickly the trailing edge will come in and then for quite a while it'll be fully eclipsed and then it'll start to exit and then it'll finish exit. If it, on the other hand, was way out here, the leading edge will get into the shadow and cross out of the shadow before the trailing edge has even come in. So all we have to do is observe an eclipse of the moon and see, um, and see what actually happens. And it turns out that, <clears throat> put the numbers here, the moon stays fully eclipsed for 1.734 times as long as it takes to enter totality. The width of the shadow is one moon diameter more than that. <clears throat> and so with that information, it turns out we can figure out what we want to know. Let's let X denote the fraction that the moon's diameter is of the Earth's. From an old tradition in mathematics that what we don't know we call X. Well, that's also the fraction then that the distance of the moon is, uh, of the moon from the Earth is of this total distance uh, out to the end of the shadow. And therefore the width of the, sh of the shadow is one minus that. I mean, for instance, if the, if the sh uh, moon's one tenth, uh, the shadow is nine tenths. It's the moon's one uh, three quarters, the shadow is one quarter. So we take the ratio of the shadow's width to the moon's width. That must be equal to the 2.734. We solve this equation and we get that one X is the reciprocal of 3.734, a little over a quarter, just under 27%. <clears throat> so, we can conclude that the radius of the moon is this number and its distance away is this. Uh, we have to take that with a grain of salt though, because remember, as I said before, the moon's orbit is elliptical and the distance varies. It actually changes between 226,000 miles and 252,000 miles. The sun now is, uh, actually it's about five, four, 407 times as big as the moon's um, about 109 times as big as the Earth, and its diameter, no, its radius is 433,000 miles. Note that that's so big that if the Sun were located where the Earth is, the Moon's orbit would be inside the Sun. <laughs> so the ratio of the um, Earth to the Moon is this 0.374. If you were interested in the real estate, on the Earth versus the Moon, the Earth, it's the square of this number because area is length times width. There's nearly 14 times as much real estate on the Earth as the Moon. It, it also means that the cross section of the Moon, of, of the Earth is 14 times that of the Moon. Moon would look a lot bigger, uh, I'm sorry, the Earth would look a lot bigger from the Moon than the Moon does from the Earth. And if you cube this number, you get 52, there's 52, times as much bulk to the Earth as the Moon. Do not assume though that their masses are in the same ratio because that requires assuming their densities are the same and we don't have any reason to believe that. In fact, it's probably not true. Uh, likewise, if we square the 109, there's nearly 12,000 times more surface area on the Sun than the Earth and about 1.3 million times the volume. Um, Stephanie mentioned in your introduction that I uh, was fascinated with astronomy when I was a kid. I probably knew everything there was to know in 1947 about astronomy. And I memorized everything. I knew the radius of every planet uh, and the radius of its orbit and the length of its day and all sorts of stuff. But one thing puzzled me that some books said that the sun was about a hundred times as big as the earth and some said it was about a million times as big. And I couldn't reconcile that. I figured if one said 109, one said 100, that's just round off error, but 100 versus a million. Well, I'll never forgive myself for 
for not thinking of the reason for this, but it's really quite obvious. It depends on how you're comparing them. Are you comparing their radii, their diameters, their circumferences, some linear measure? Then it's about 109. If you're talking about volume, you have to cube that. And so roughly speaking, about a million. All right. <clears throat> Well, we finished uh, everything we want to say about the Earth and the Sun. So now let's turn to the planets. You know, when we look at, up in the sky, we see enormous numbers of heavenly bodies, but the bulk of them are fixed relative to each other. Yes, the stars all rise and set, but that's due to the rotation of the Earth. Relative to each other, they stay fixed. That's why there's a Big Dipper and there's an Orion and so on. The, the constellations are visible because the stars are not changing. Oh, admittedly, they're changing very, very slowly, but you have to live 10,000 years to see that. There are seven objects in the sky which move. The sun and the moon are two, the other five, and I'm talking about what can be seen with the unaided eye. Of course, there's planets that were discovered with telescopes, but just with the unaided eye, you can see five other bodies and they're the planets. And by the way, the word planet comes from Greek, meaning wanderers, because they wandered around in the sky. Um, incidentally, uh, seven, seven things we can see in the sky that, don't, that uh, are not fixed. Is it a coincidence that we have seven days in the week? No, I think not. After all, there's Saturn's day, there's Sun's day, there's Moon's day. If you understand, want to understand the rest, you have to go through Norse mythology. See, this, the planets were given names of the Roman gods. Mercury, the planet Mercury, was named after the, um, the god of uh, communication, the messenger god, uh, who's often depicted with a pair of uh, wings on his heels. His image used to be on our dimes before um, they put Roosevelt on them. Uh, Venus, so brilliant and beautiful in the evening sky. Um, it's named after Venus, the Roman god of beauty. Mars is a red planet, reminds us of blood and warfare, and so it's named after the god of the Roman god of war. Jupiter, the largest planet, so it's named after the king of the gods. And Saturn is the slowest moving planet, so it's named after the god of old age. So if you want to stay and understand the rest of our days of the week, you have to go through Norse mythology. Woden's day is named for Woden or also called Wotan, the king of the gods in Norse mythology. Then comes Thor's day. Thor was the god of thunder and the god of war. And Frida's day is named for Frida, the, the goddess of beauty. I skipped over Tuesday because to be honest, I don't remember the name of the uh, Norse god that is equivalent to Mercury. Now, um, two of the planets, Mercury and Venus, never move very far from the sun, but the other two, the other three, um, can be anywhere in, a, in the plane of the ecliptic. Uh, we infer from that that Mercury and Venus are closer um, to the sun than we are, and the other planets are farther out. So let's see uh, if we could figure out how far these inner planets are from the sun. And we can do that by simply measuring the maximum angle that they ever make with the sun. Here's a sketch showing um, Venus coming around in its orbit. Uh, here it is at a certain point, and this dashed line is our line of sight to it. And it comes around here, and this is our line of sight. And then it comes down here. But see, at this moment here, when it reaches the maximum angle from the sun, our line of sight is just grazing its orbit and it's perpendicular to the radius. And therefore, Earth, Venus, and the Sun make a right triangle with the right angle up here. So standing here at the Earth, we can measure this angle and it's, it's sine is this side over this side, which is Venus's orbital radius divided by the Earth's. Very simple then, take the sine of this angle. It turns out it's 46.3300 degrees, just a little bigger than half of a right angle. And so its orbital radius is this fraction of Earth's radius. We can convert that to miles if we want, because we know now that the Earth is 93 million miles from the sun. But it's also 
reasonable to leave it this way. Miles are not a very handy unit of measuring distance in astronomy because it's so small compared to sizes. Astronomers often use the distance from the uh, Earth to the sun as a measuring rod, and they call it an astronomical unit. And so the distance of Venus from the sun in astronomical units is this number here. By uh, similar arithmetic, we can do the same for Mercury. It's never more than 22.774 degrees from the sun, about half as far as Venus, a quarter of a right angle. And its orbital radius is about 39% of the Earth's. <clears throat> Now, what about their, the lengths of their years, what we call their orbital um, periods? Earth's is 365 and a quarter days, and we can easily measure that by just looking at the seasons and watching the sun move through the background of fixed stars. But it's harder to tell with Venus and Mercury because we're moving too. What we do know is that this number here, 584 about, is the number of days it takes for Venus to go through a complete cycle from being the morning star to the evening star and back again, or say from transiting the sun to farthest out this way to behind the sun to farthest out this way and back again. But we're moving too, so that's not its, that's not its, uh, its year. Let's look at it this way. Suppose we focus on the two planets when they're lined up with the sun, so like this, beginning, with the Earth and, the, and uh, Venus in line around the sun. So they start to move from there and Venus is faster, so it gets ahead and it's kind of like two cars on a racetrack. The car that's a little faster will keep gaining <clears throat> a distance at a certain point, it'll be halfway around the track and then it starts coming up from behind and pretty soon it overtakes the other car and it, we say that it has lapped it it has uh, gone then one more lap uh, than the slower one. Well, that takes 584 days here. So let's see, 584 days is about a year and eight months. So the Earth will have gone around its orbit once and be about two thirds of the way around again when Venus catches up. And at that point, Venus is going around one, two and two thirds time. So from that, uh, consideration, we can calculate Venus's year. Um, let Venus's year be X. Um, if we divide the 584 by 365, that's the exact number of orbits that, that Earth would have gone through, as I say, about one and two thirds. Venus has made one more orbit than we have, so that's equal to this. And if we multiply the number of orbits by the number of days per orbit, we get 584. We can easily solve this expression, this equation for x. It's the product of 584 by 365 divided by the sum of 584 by 365. It works out to about 225. That's the length of Venus's year. It's how many days it takes for Venus to go around the sun once, which is about five eighths of one of our years. And Mercury is much faster. Uh, it's year is about 88 days, which is a little less than three months. It goes about four times, four, four, through four years in about the same time as we, we go through one. Um, and what about orbital, um, periods? I skipped the sky here, didn't I? Wait a minute, that doesn't look right. Um, oh, we saw that one. How about this one? No, we saw that one too. Oh no, I'm sorry, this is, this is where I wanted to be. I made a table here for the first three planets and I show their orbital radii in astronomical units. Of course, the Earth is by definition one and Venus is that 0.72 that we saw and Mercury is about 0.39. And just for fun, I took the squares of all those numbers and the cubes. We'll see in a minute why that was useful. Over here, I have the periods in Earth years. Mercury is a little less than a quarter. Venus is about five eighths. And I've squared the periods and I've cubed the periods. Now there's something interesting about this table. 
Uh, what do you what do you see in this table that might be of interest? Well, okay, time's up. <laughs> uh, this table, this um, column, uh, the cube of the radius, and this column, square of the periods, are the same. Now, it's somewhat of a, um, an illusion that they're equal because we chose the units to be all ones down here. If you chose other units, you wouldn't get equality, but you would get proportionality. And so we can safely say that the square of the period is proportional to, uh, that square of the period is proportional to the cube of the radius. And this is known as Kepler's third law after Johannes Kepler, a very um, industrious 17th century astronomer. Um, <clears throat> do, does Kepler's third law apply to the other planets? Well, unfortunately there's no direct way to tell because we don't know how far they are. We can't use the same methods that we used here because remember they go all the way around us. There's nothing equivalent to finding the, uh, the orbital radii by measuring uh, their, their, their maximum angle. But hey, we live in, a, in an orderly universe, don't we? I mean, it's, it's, it's a fundamental principle of science that you see some things happen and you say, oh, there's a pattern here and I'm gonna believe that that pattern continues to hold until I see evidence that it doesn't. And that's where scientific laws come from. So with respect to the three outer planets, the ones that are visible to the unaided eye, we can measure their years through the same uh, theory about lapping. Of course, we're lapping them, uh, but we can find their orbital periods. And then using Kepler's third law, we can uh, infer what their uh, orbital radii are. Um, now, uh, by the way, there's an <clears throat> interesting way to use um, Jupiter or Jupiter's moons actually to find the speed of light. Um, and Galileo could have done this, but I guess he didn't think of it. However, uh, uh, about 30 years after Galileo died, a German physicist by the name of Rumer in, in 1675 did this. Galileo had discovered that Jupiter has moons. Uh, he could see four of them, which are big enough to have been visible in his telescope. Actually, Jupiter has a lot more moons, but they were too small for him to see. Uh, this was a radical discovery, by the way. It was just the first time that human beings had ever seen anything moving around something other than the Earth. And it very much upset the Catholic Church, which didn't want to believe what... <laughs> Galileo was showing him through the telescope. Uh, <clears throat> so you've got these moons going around Jupiter and, and you could make a, a, a schedule for these moons. You could say, okay, here's Ganymede and at a certain time it's over here and then it crosses the face of the planet and then it finishes crossing and then it's out here and then it comes back and it's behind the planet and it comes visible again. So you make a table and you can do that for each of the four moons. Well, if you did that at a time when the relation of the Earth and Jupiter was like this, where Earth is between the Sun and Jupiter, uh, you made the schedule then. And you, what you'd find is that as time passed and Jupiter went on its around its, its orbit, um, let me see if I can bring this whole thing up here. Um, the, the, the moons would start falling behind schedule until the Earth was all the way around here and Jupiter had moved on a little bit and, um, and it's here. So Earth and, Earth and Jupiter are opposite each other now. <clears throat> now then the moons are, are about 17 minutes behind schedule, a little more accurately, 998 seconds or a little less accurately, a thousand seconds. And then as time continues to pass and and Earth begins to catch up with Jupiter. Pretty soon they're lined up again like this and um, the moons are back on schedule. Well, obviously the moons are not gonna care what the Earth is doing. Uh, this, this must have something to do with the way the message is getting to us about the behavior of the moons. Well, yeah, the, the, we don't see the moons Directly, we see their light that's reflected off them and the light has to travel from there to, to us. 
when, when we're in this position or this position, the light has to travel the difference between Jupiter's radius and ours. Whereas in this position, it has to travel Jupiter's radius plus ours. So it has to go the diameter of the earth further in this position than in either of the other two. Well, let's see, the diameter of the Earth's orbit is twice its radius, about 186 million miles. It's got to do that in a thousand seconds. So divide and you've got about 186,000 miles per second. So more exactly, it's this. But that's how the speed of light was determined. Um, <clears throat> well, I see I'm running out of time here, but uh, I do want to say a little bit about how we go on out of the solar system into the galaxy around us. The way we can measure distances to relatively nearby stars is through what's called parallax. Um, as, as the Earth moves around its orbit, uh, a nearby star's position relative to the background will appear to change. It's the same as if you were walking along a road, let's say back and forth, and you see some trees in the foreground and mountains in the distance, the trees would appear to shift back and forth relative to the mountains. That's what we're talking about. That angle of, um, of change can be measured. And as we did with finding the length of the Earth's shadow, we can use the uh, radian measure of this angle, uh, which we know, and the diameter of the Earth's orbit, which we know, to infer this distance here. Now, it's a very subtle thing because uh, it turns out that even for the nearest star to the sun, which is Alpha Centauri, um, it's, um, where's the number here? Uh, 1.6 seconds of arc, <laughs> it's very small. And we infer then it is 4.38 light years from us. That looks very pretty delicate, but it turns out the Hubble telescope uh, could handle that very easily. The Hubble was powerful enough that it could distinguish the two ends of a meter stick at the moon, about one two thousandth of a second of arc. So start with that parallax or less, um, we, can be, we can relatively uh, accurately measure their distance. And that's up to about 12,500 light years. And there's literally hundreds of thousands of stars within that distance. Um, so, um, it, the way we can move further than that is through the coincidence that there's stars called Cepheid variables. Uh, way back in 1786, an astronomer named John Goodricke discovered that there was a star in the constellation of Cepheus whose brightness varied, it could get bigger and smaller, uh, in a fixed cycle. And since that time, thousands of these stars have been discovered. They're called Cepheid variables. Um, <clears throat> why that happens is probably related to the fact that the star is nearing the end of its life and there's an instability. But um, it, it turns out that the way we do this is by correcting a star's apparent magnitude for the distance it is away. Some stars, after all, might look bright, but they're not really very bright, they're just close. And other stars might, might seem dim, but they're really very bright, they just happen to be far away. The way to determine a star's absolute brightness is to imagine it at a fixed distance. Let's say you imagine all stars were 100 light years away. How bright would they look? Um, well, it turns out, you can see from this uh, sketch here, as a pulse of light goes out from a star, it's on a spherical wavefront. Remember again, it look like circles, but they're in reality, they're spheres. And this, the energy is conserved, but it has to be spread out over a, an expanding surface area. The surface goes up as the square of the distance, so the intensity of the light goes down as the square of the distance. It's brightness, in other words. It's gonna go down at, inversely as the square of the distance. So, with stars whose distance we know, we can see their apparent brightness and correct for that distance by imagining how bright they'd be when they were the standard, let's say 100 light years away. So Henrietta Leavitt 
an astronomer in, at uh, Harvard in 1908 um, discovered that there was a relationship between the period of variation of these Cepheid variables and their absolute brightness. So you can infer either from the other. Well, that means with stars that are too far away for us to know how bright they are, we could, we could use their um, periodic, period of variation to infer their absolute brightness. Then we could compare that with their apparent brightness and figure out how far away they are. So that's how, uh, that's one way that we were able to uh, infer distances that are too far for parallax. Um, uh, I don't know if I'll have time to talk about the rest of this because uh, we're over time already. There's something called the red shift, uh, which is a consequence of the Doppler effect. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there's a way that you can infer from the, not only the apparent size of something, but the rate at which it's changing and its speed, how far it is. But I think probably I'll have to stop there. Uh, this is about all I was gonna say anyway, but I'll just, skip over these last few and say, there it is. If you um, need to know any more, <laughs> ask me later. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and see what you've got, Stephanie, from, uh, from the chat, if anything. Thank you so much. I know, I feel like um, you probably have enough material for a whole nother hour. <laughs> uh, it's, um, it was really, really interesting. And so far, there's uh, just one question in the chat um, if you still have a minute or two, um, Rick, to answer some questions. But uh, this one says, so if the moon didn't happen to be the same angular size as the sun, would the ancients not have been able to measure moon, sun size and distance? Well, we might've found out some other way to do it. Many of these um, uh, measurements uh, can be done by other means. Uh, like I talked about two measures of ways of measuring the size of the earth. There's other ways of doing that. <clears throat> I don't know off the top of my head another way to do it, but um, we probably are. So I think I'll have to leave it at that and say it would have been more difficult, but I don't know how they would have done it. <laughs> um, and for every, that was, there was just one question in the chat, but um, anybody is welcome. You can just unmute yourself if you'd like and ask any questions um, for Rick Letman. Sure, sorry, how again were the Earth, Moon, and Earth, Sun distances figured out? Because I figured those are also pretty important in some of these calculations. Um, that was the method that uh, Aristarchus used. Um, let me bring that. Uh, let me bring that back up. Um, let's see. How can I do that? I, oh, here it is. Hang on a second here. Now, here it is. Now, I am I sharing my screen? Uh, no. All right, let me bring that up. Here it is. We see it now. This this was the slide. Um, <clears throat> it, it's based on looking at the moon when it's exactly half full. Um, you know, uh, one edge of the moon is, is, no matter where it is in its phases, is a semicircle. Uh, that's the outer one. The, the inner one is 
um, concave at times and convex at times, but it's, it's essentially half of an ellipse. But the transition between those happens when the moon is exactly half full. And uh, my argument is, our Aristarchus's argument is that at that point, this angle up here is 90 degrees. Because the sun's rays are coming in and illuminating half the moon. That's what we see. We must be then at 90 degrees to those, those uh, rays. So this is a 90 degree angle. We have a right triangle then made by Earth, moon, and sun. By measuring this angle uh, and taking its um, secant, we have the ratio of this side, the hypotenuse, to this side that's adjacent to it. Well, that's precisely what we're interested in, the distance to the sun divided by the distance to the moon. And as I say, he, he thought that angle was 87 degrees, but he was using very crude instruments. With uh, better instruments, we find it's this angle here, very close to 90 degrees. And uh, it turns out the secant of that angle is, is about, well, it's almost 400. That's how way back in 280 BC, um, somebody figured out that the sun is about 400 times as far away as the moon. And because of the fact that their angular measures are the same, uh, that means the sun is about 400 times bigger. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. But that was the ratio. So I was wondering how the absolute Earth-Moon distance was, that was established. Well, that was, um, that was the next slide here. Um, uh, where do I get this back? Well, that was the one that had to do with the eclipse of the moon. Um, be, because from the, from the size of the Earth and the uh, apparent size of the sun, we were able to figure out that, that the tip of the Earth's shadow is about 900,000 miles out in space. And by observing the eclipse of the moon and seeing how much time it spends going into the totality and how much time it spends in totality and so on. From that ratio, we were able to find out what fraction of the size of the earth the moon is, and then the fraction of the size of the, of the moon's orbit to that distance out to the shadow. That's where we actually found out how far away the moon is. And, um, and also how big it is. And then from this, this uh, stuff that's still here on the screen, we were able to figure out the sun must be uh, approximately 400 times as big and 400 times as far away. So that, that was that eclipse of the moon, the total eclipse of the moon that we were using for that. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, again, you can unmute yourself or jot it in the chat. Okay. Here's that slide. I just found it. <laughs> this is the slide that answers your question, uh, John Gregg. I think that was you. Um, I see, once we know the moon fits into the same size cone as the sun, we can put that cone in this direction. Those two dashed blue lines are that cone. Moon must fit in there. And so when, if it's close to the earth, it's gotta be small. If it's get farther out, it could be bigger. But how does it compare to the shadow? Because when, when we're close to the earth, the shadow is wide and when we're further away, it's, it's, it's much narrower. So there's a compensation as we move out, the moon can be bigger and the shadow is smaller. And by looking at what happens when the moon goes into eclipse, we can figure out the fraction of its, of, of the earth's size that it is, therefore the fraction of this distance, this distance is. Um, somebody asked, can these slides be downloaded and referenced? Um, I will, uh, we have a 
RFO Speaker Series YouTube channel that I just set up with recordings of all our past presentations. And if you don't find it on YouTube, a link to that is on a uh, speaker series page on our website. I think it's listed under events, I believe. Um, so you can at least find the presentation there. So well, this whole thing was recorded. So all the um, slides should be there for you. If you want me to actually give the lecture again somewhere, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> I know I, I I feel like we need to give you uh, more time though, <laughs> so you have time to uh, um, to expand on those other things you wanted to expand on. So <laughs> we got we got a good ways out into the into the universe. We, <laughs> the techniques I showed, we can actually figure out how far an Andromeda galaxy is away because there are Cephe variables in it. Um, <clears throat> But for the really distant stuff, we, we really need to use uh, the redshift. We need the Hubble constant. We need that stuff. And uh, I just didn't have enough time to, to explain that carefully. <laughs> you know, of course, that the farther, uh, the farther away something is, the longer ago it was when it emitted the light we're seeing. So. Andromeda galaxy is 2 million light years away. But if you go out and look at it tonight and you have to be in a very dark uh, space with a clear sky, but you can see it. Um, <clears throat> the light that's coming to your eye tonight left there 2 million years ago. Who knows, maybe the Andromeda galaxy blew up a million years ago and the information to that effect is only halfway here. It'll be another million years till we find out about it. The farther away something is, the deeper into the past we're looking. Yeah, it's amazing. It's hard to even wrap your head around that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Rick. I we all really appreciate it. I know some people said thank you, and and we're doing a, a little um, clapping emoji. So, <laughs> um, thank you very very much. And um, we may take you up on your offer to to give the talk again because uh, it was definitely very interesting, and we really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye, everybody.